is this question of who wrote Shakespeare. It's always been a subject which has had more appeal, has had more, it, uh, aroused more interest in this country than it has in Europe. Uh, the English have always been very inhibited about it. It's quite a tyranny, actually. The, uh, the, and I find this in so many subjects that um, there's an orthodoxy, and they tell you at college that they want, they want you to think for yourself, but woe betide you if you do very often. <laughs> you know. So uh, uh, if you have any ambitions in literature, don't express doubts about Shakespeare in, in public, because it won't get you anywhere, really. <laughs> I'm just amazed. You know, there's thousands of books written on this subject, as well as journals, magazines, articles, and uh, 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 pamphlets, all kinds of things. There's literally thousands of books, published books, and there's one man, um, quite near the beginning of the century, a uh, Monsieur Demblon, who believes the Earl of Rutland wrote Shakespeare, and he was said to have written, read 5,000 books while coming to this conclusion. Today, you couldn't possibly read them all. There's far too many of them. But what really uh, I find fascinating is how many people of the same age, same education, same culture, uh, same colleges and so on, working on the same small, limited amount of facts known about Shakespeare and this authorship question, have come to, not only have come to quite different conclusions, but have come to complete different certainties. I won't hear a word from, from, from anyone who's got another theory. It's quite amazing that, how, how you can get your mind so firmly fixed on an idea that it becomes actually part of you. But luckily we've got a very good account of this, written by that best of American writers, Mark Twain, who wrote a book called Is Shakespeare Dead? Uh, which was, a, which was um, a criticism of the established authorship. It's a very, very funny book. It's the only short, funny book on the subject. Actually, his uh, editors often don't include it in his, in his collected works, because he didn't approve of it. But he described how he became a Baconian. What happened was he was, um, uh, you remember, the, assisting the pilot on the Mississippi River boat. And this pilot was very fond of Shakespeare, and he, and he heard about the authorship question, was angry about it, said, obviously, it was written by... Mr. Shakespeare of Stratford, these Bacanians are mad and such. And Mark Twain said, I was inclined first to agree with him. Then I saw he wanted an argument. So I took up the other side. And he went, he described how he became a Baconian. Um, oh yes, he said, study, practice, experience, and handling my end of the matter, that's the argument with the, with the, um, with the remote pilot, presently enabled me to take my new position almost seriously. A bit later, utterly seriously. Finally, fiercely, rabidly, uncompromisingly, after that, I was wedded to my faith. I was theoretically ready to die for it. And I looked down with compassion, not unmixed with scorn, upon everybody else's faith that didn't tally with mine. That faith imposed upon me by self-interest in that ancient day remains my faith today. And in it I found comfort, solace, peace, and never-failing joy. <laughs> they're just arbitrary. They've taken one idea of things from the, from the data available, and they've built one picture of it. But by taking from the same sources of data, choosing other data, which they've excluded, you can make completely other views of the world of any other subject. And nothing better demonstrates it than this, than this wonderful question of who wrote Shakespeare. I've uh, you know, counted up the number of claims, actually, which have been made in, in, in respectively published and rationally argued books, and there's no less than 24 major uh, candidates who, who, who had little school behind them, of people who said that, the, that they were the main author of Shakespeare. And there's, I counted, 39 others who've been included in a group who wrote Shakespeare. And there's many others. Some people say it's the Rosicrucians or the Jesuits and so on. So you actually expand this list so it includes practically every known person at that time. Uh, and of course, I can't really go into all these theories, but some of them stand out above others, of course, just by their popularity. Now, the first theory, of course, is they're written by this man from Stratford-on-Avon, about whom nothing is known or nothing, certainly, which connects him with the plays and the poems. And this is very interesting because literary experts say that it's the only case in the whole of literature where there's absolutely no connection at all between the known life of the, of the supposed author and the character and mind of the author as, as, as appears in the works. There's nothing in Shakespeare's life which connects him with any literary activity, uh, certainly not with, the, uh, with that type of mind which is displayed in the plays, which is called a universal mind, because Shakespeare seems to have known it, everything. And uh, uh, I'll tell you some of the qualities which have been attributed to the author of Shakespeare, purely on the strength of the works. But these are very, uh, um, these are very certain, because they've been looked at by experts in, in many, many subjects. 
One thing absolutely certain, I think it's agreed by practically everybody, is the author of Shakespeare was a great lawyer, a great initiated lawyer, uh, that is, a, a leading man in his, in his subject. And that's generally agreed. A, a, a judges have gone through it. There's been many judges who became Baconians on that account. And they've said he never makes a mistake. Any layman writing about the law is bound to make a phrase a little wrong. You know, it's like somebody imitating your accent. They'll, they'll go, to some, go to a certain extent, but they'll, uh, but they'll miss out something and you'll know. And lawyers are certain that Shakespeare never makes a mistake in his law, which he speaks about the whole time, that he must have been a qualified lawyer. But then other people who studied, say, the social um, background of the Elizabethan age, say it's absolutely certain that he was an aristocrat. He moved in very high circles uh, because he knew all the jargon, the ways of aristocratic talk and the manners. He knew all the terms, the sporting terms of falconry and uh, uh, hunting and so on, which had only been known to the, uh, the few people uh, who at that time uh, um, could indulge in things like hunting and the whole social intercourse of the court. So he must have been a courtier. Then they say he was certainly, whatever else he was, a great classical scholar. And he was such a good classical scholar that all the plays are filled with classical allusions <coughs> from Latin, Greek, and uh, also uh, for works which were not published, not translated at the time, in Spanish, Italian, and French. So uh, he must have known these languages. And in the classics, he was a very, very leading scholar, because he didn't just quote, as if you look it up for a book, he obviously quoted from memory, because you find little paraphrases, little sort of slight mistakes in the phrasing. Uh, and there's so many subjects in which Shakespeare was said to be an expert, rather who could possibly have been the man who knew all this? There's been many answers given to this. But the official case that they're written by the man from Stratford has given rise to the most extraordinary series of very, very lengthy biographies. It's always said that the facts known about uh, uh, Shakespeare, uh, whose name is actually Shakespeare, pronounced because it's spelled S-H-A-K-S or S-H-A-G-S, Shakespeare. Shakespeare, with the hyphen, is actually a, a very obviously a pseudonym, a made-up name. It wasn't the man's name at all. He was called Shakespeare, but it was pronounced Shakespeare. And that's made very plain by the uh, uh, spellings of his name on, uh, on um, documents and so on, rather than the family's name. The biographies of him are very extensive. People have done several volumes. The, it's said that the facts known about this man's life could be written on one side of a sheet of writing paper. And that doesn't appear to be the case, uh, the documented facts. And yet these uh, uh, biographies have been extended to several volumes. At the beginning of this century, Sir Sidney Lee wrote The Life of Shakespeare, 720 very closely printed pages and so on. How could this possibly be done? There's even got a book, Shakespeare the Boy, on a period of life, not, not one single fact is known. <laughs> his only life is known that he was christened on a certain day, that on, on, when he was about 18, he married a woman eight years uh, 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 older than him who was pregnant at the time, because a few months later she gave birth to a, a daughter. And no one quite knows who she was. You go to Stratford, which is a marvellous, um, it's a, a wonderful place of pilgrimage, but it's completely phony. Mm -hmm. Rather amusing this, Baconian Francis Carr, some years ago, sued the Birthplace Trust, which is the biggest tourist business in England, uh, on the grounds he bought a ticket to see Shakespeare's birthplace, and he's shown a reconstructed place, reconstructed house, uh, 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 which was no evidence he was ever in the house. And uh, the ministers were trying to upset, uh, uh, didn't they want to do with this case? Because there's this thing called the Trade Description Act, where you weren't allowed to make false claims in advertising. <laughs> and this is obviously a false claim. So the magistrates took counsel, uh, I suppose rang up headquarters, and came and said, uh, uh, it's not covered by the Act, because it's not actually a business, it's a birthplace. And uh, of course, it's the biggest tourist business in England. But you know, one has to bend the law occasionally. And it is a very nice place to go straight. We have a good time, even though it is spurious. Like most pilgrimage places like that anyway. These facts are very disturbing, actually, because in the Bible of Shakespeare, there's nothing, really, which shows him to be any more than a man who came to, who um, used to leave his wife, his older wife, uh, probably in his middle 20s, and come to London, where he entered the theatre. And going to the theatre world in those days was like working in a whorehouse. And in fact, it was very much the same environment because the theatre was down on the south bank of the Thames where the, where the Lord Mayor's writ didn't run. And it's completely surrounded by cut purses and coney catchers, they were called, con men and thieves and prostitutes and everything. And when he died, he left a will. This is the only personal thing about him. But this will is very distressing to the orthodox because it mentions, he makes that extraordinary bequest to his wife of simply of my second best bed. 
the rest went to his daughter. There's no mention of any literary association, associates or friends or literary properties, no books, nothing that a writer would have. And most significantly, Shakespeare's second daughter, Judith, was illiterate. She couldn't write her name. She signed with a mark, as did the old Mr. Shakespeare, the father. And it's quite unlikely, it's almost impossible, that a man who, uh, who, who wrote Shakespeare, who had such great respect for learning and, and literature, would have allowed his daughter, who is not a stranger, who lived in the same town, would have allowed her not to have any education, but to be illiterate throughout her life. Uh, so this will is, is very perplexing. And indeed, the great doubt about Shakespeare, no one ever mentioned him in connection with any literary dealings at all by many of the uh, plays published under the name of Shakespeare, like the London Prodigal, the Yorkshire Tragedy, and so on, are not attributed to Shakespeare at all. And uh, he never claimed any rights in any of these plays. He showed no interest in them. He uh, apparently never profited by them. Uh, and amazingly enough, um, there was a chap called Henslow, who was the uh, great theatre owner and manager of the time. And in his diary, he wrote down the name of every play he received, when it was put on, what the receipts were, who the authors were, and so on. Not one reference, a reference to every single play out of the time. And practically every play of the time. Not one reference to Shakespeare. Again, those famous letter writers of the time, many of whose letters are preserved at the British Museum. We just don't mention the man. There's a strange silence about him. Um, the greatest literary man of his time, or the greatest idealist and writer of his time, Sir Francis Bacon, apparently never met him and never referred to him at all. So it's as if this man hardly existed. Uh, later on, when he was um, when he was seven years dead, uh, at his death, the Shakespeare death, no one's living at all. There's no obituaries, no poems in his praise, which is quite extraordinary. Because when Johnson died, there were whole books of praise of him pu published by many poets, and every other poet of the time of playwright had that now fellows wrote them elegant obituaries, elegant uh, pra uh, poems of praise, and they sometimes they were buried in Westminster Abbey and so on. But no one mentioned a thing when Shakespeare died. No one came round to Stratford to see uh, to see what had happened, attend the funeral or anything like that. Um, and only seven years later, when this first folio of Shakespeare's plays came out, it was a complete mystery. The picture on the front is quite obviously uh, uh, not of any person at all. It's a very wooden thing by, by a young Dutch apprentice who'd never seen Shakespeare in his life. And it's a wooden thing. Some people think it's a mask because there's a very uh, uh, um, a thick line under the chin which looks like a mask. And then uh, the memorial to him in the, in the church the, the figure there has been changed since. It, look, it didn't look at all like the picture. No one knows at all what he looked like, because this, this bust you see in the church of, on, on, on Shakespeare's memorial. <coughs> Originally, it showed a man with drooping moustaches. It was then changed, and they put a quill pen in his hand, so he looks like a writer. And that pen is not in original, in the early uh, uh, reproductions of that bust. It's a later edition. But let me come down to a more, to a more positive side of this. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to sustain a case for Shakespeare uh, as his great writer. He just does not fit, and that's generally admitted. The most obvious candidate, of course, is Bacon. Sir Francis Bacon was the great idealist of his time, and he wanted to codify all knowledge, all the new discoveries of science, all the traditions of the old science, of, of alchemy and philosophy and so on, um, and to make one codified system, or rather statement, of the world's knowledge as it were, to save the world, to give a new a standard for all the sciences and arts. And uh, he, he did this to a large extent in his published writings. But he also referred to another part of this work, the work he called the Great Instauration, being the Great Revival. There was another part of it which he didn't publish, has never been found, which he promised he'd deal with characters showing different types of human character, the influence of environment, the influence of fate upon them, and this had to be presented in a dramatic form. And these works are not known, and the Baconians say, because they're the plays of Shakespeare. But the strongest case of all is that Oxford was a man who wrote the sonnets. And as far as I actually, being a fortune, I didn't commit myself to absolute belief, but as far as I believe anything in the subjects, it is that the Earl of Oxford was that self-pitying, tragic figure which emerges as the sonneteer, the many wrote these 153 uh, uh, love poems called the sonnets, most of which are addressed to a young man, and some to this mysterious dark-eyed lady, who is probably Oxford's mistress, Anne Vavasour. 
uh, the, the one of the few bits of good scientific evidence in this business is that Dr. Mendenhall, uh, who specialized in establishing uh, the authorships of disputed texts, and he developed a very interesting <coughs> system. He found that every writer has a characteristic word length count. That is, in every, any given thousand words by a certain author, written on any subject, any given subject, you'll find there are so many three-letter words, so many four-letter words, so many five-letter words, and so on in proportion. And Mendenhall <coughs> made studies of different texts by the same writer, discovered that people do, are consistent in their, in, in their writing, in, in the way they use this balance, this proportion of words of a certain number of letters. And he was, uh, Mr. Mendenhall was, was then commissioned by a Baconian to see if he could find this correspondence between Shakespeare's texts and Bacon's. And he came up, to do this, he had to test other writers against, the, um, against Shakespeare's canon. And he had disappointing news for the Baconian uh, 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 um, enthusiast who commissioned him. He said, no, Shakespeare's word count is not the same as Bacon's, but funny enough, it's exactly the same as somebody's called Christopher Marlowe. And he shows a graph which is exactly the same. And it does seem that Marlowe had a very big hand in Shakespeare, possibly after his alleged death in 15, alleged murder in 1596. Now, what's one to make of all this? Uh, um, uh, 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 being a fortune, uh, uh, I look with sympathy upon all theories and don't believe or disbelieve any of them, absolutely. And uh, it's quite ridiculous <coughs> to, take, to, to pretend you know when you don't know. So you see, it's a very wide subject very delightful, very confusing. It can be dreadfully, dreadfully addictive and obsessional. <laughs> uh, 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 but with a forty in mind, uh, a forty is so good at that, you don't become obsessed. You just take the delight for it. And you, you communicate with the great minds who've gone into it. You find sympathy for all the theorists, and you thank them for the entertainment they provided. And it is something well worth going into. I don't think, we're, and yes, some, unless some firm evidence turns up, we never really get to know who wrote Shakespeare. <laughs>